seeking to walk in the way of Jesus. We are an open and affirming church, faithfully using who we are and what we have to serve those on the margins of our community. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Ubuntu is the Shosho word that recognizes that human beings need each other for survival and well-being. A person is a person only through other persons, we say. We must care for one another in order to thrive. For many outside the South African culture, it can be somewhat difficult to encapsulate what 
Ubuntu is and means exactly. In general terms, it is about our interconnectedness to one another in the web of life. We are all connected. We are in this world and life together, and we need one another, even maybe especially those with whom we do not agree. Ubuntu is about how we are with one another, that by honoring the sacred in one another, we honor the sacred within ourselves. Ubuntu is about a generosity of spirit, sharing, living in harmony, because we cannot function without the gifts of everyone. Ubuntu is knowing that our world and we ourselves are diminished whenever injustice, oppression, or humiliation takes place. Ubuntu is about being open and available to others, knowing that we have a place in God's realm, and so does everyone else. So we have no need to think too highly or lowly of ourselves or others. Though the specific concept of Ubuntu originates in South Africa, it is a deeply theological and spiritual perspective that empowers us to know we and others are loved by God and that we are all in this together, no matter where we come from. When we can begin to understand and live Ubuntu, we can learn how to truly forgive ourselves and others and repent, returning to the goodness God made us for, all of us, even those we consider enemy. O oh love, let me turn aside in awe of morning's fire, rising in silences that speak a word recreating the world. Your holy presence unnameable, yet voicing a song within uncontainable. Your yes of yearning, meeting hearts that burn in hurt and hope of all that dares to rise, in resurrection's answer to every period placed by the world's way as the final word. Yes, love, let me turn aside and see the fire of the morning sky, begging me to pause into the pulse of Pentecost flame of love, uncontrollable as light rising and landing on everything and everyone, without exception, in reckless abandon. Let your yes be answered by my own. granting again and again my heart's deepest desire, discovering the truth that you never stop holding the whole creation, 
drenching it with the fire of your holy love. Fourteen Cows for America by Carmen Agraditi in cooperation with Wilson Camelli Nyoma. The remote village waits for a story to be told. News travels slowly to this corner of Kenya. As Camelli nears his village, he watches a herd of bull giraffes cross the open grassland. He smiles. He has been away a long time. A girl sitting under a guava tree sees him first and cries out to the others. The children run to him with the speed and grace of cheetahs. He greets them with a gentle touch on the head, a warrior's blessing. The rest of the tribe soon surrounds Kameli. These are his people. These are the Maasai. Once they were feared warriors, now they live peaceably as nomadic cattle herders. They treat their cows as kindly as they do their children. They sing to them, they give them names, they shelter the young ones in their homes. Without the herd, the tribe might starve. To the Maasai, the cow is life. Supa, hello! Kameli hears again and again. Everyone wants to greet him. His eyes find his mother across the Enkong, the ring of huts with their roofs of sunbanked dung. She spreads her arms and calls to him. Aqua, welcome, my son. Kameli sighs. He is home. This is sweeter and sadder because he cannot stay. He must return to the faraway country where he is learning to be a doctor. He thinks of New York then. He remembers September. A child asks if he has brought any stories. Kameli nods. He has brought with him one story. It has burned a hole in his heart. But first he must speak with the elders. 
Later, in a tradition as old as the Maasai, the rest of the tribe gathers under an acacia tree to hear the story. There is a terrible stillness in the air as the tale unfolds. With growing disbelief, men, women, and children listen. Buildings so tall they can touch the sky? Fires so hot they can melt iron? Smoke and dust so thick they can block out the sun? The story ends. More than 3,000 souls are lost. A great silence falls over the Maasai. Kameli waits. He knows his people. They are fierce when provoked, but easily move to kindness when they hear of suffering or injustice. At last an elder speaks. He is shaken, but above all he is sad. What can we do for these poor people? Nearby a cow lows. Heads turn toward the herd. To the Maasai, Camille says softly, the cow is life. Turning to the others, Kameli offers his only cow, and Gros. He asks for their blessing. They give it gladly, but they want to offer something more. The tribe sends word to the United States Embassy in Nairobi. In response, the embassy sends a diplomat. His jeep jounces along the dust, rugged roads. He is hot and tired. He thinks he is going to meet with Maasai elders. He cannot be more wrong. As the jeep nears the edge of the village, the man sits up. Clearly, this is no ordinary diplomatic visit. This is a ceremony. Hundreds of Maasai greet the American in full tribal splendor. At the sight of the brilliant blood-red tunics and spectacular beaded collars, he can only marvel. It is a day of sacred ritual. Young warriors dance, leaping into the air like fish from a stream. Women sing mournful songs. Children fill their bellies with milk. Speeches are exchanged. And now it is time. Kameli and his people gather on a sacred knoll far from the village. The only sound is the gentle chiming of cowbells. The elders chant a blessing in Ma. As the Maasai people of Kenya present... 14 Cows for America. Because there is no nation so powerful it cannot be wounded, nor a people so small they cannot offer mighty comfort. Good morning. Our scripture reading this morning is from Acts chapter 11, verses 1 through 18 from the Inclusive Bible. The apostles and the community in Judea heard that Gentiles, too, had accepted the word of God. As a result, when Peter went up to Jerusalem, some of the Jewish believers took issue with him. So you have been visiting the Gentiles and eating with them, have you, they said. Peter then explained the whole affair to them step by step from the beginning. One day, when I was in the town of Joppa, I fell into a trance while at prayer and had a vision of something like a big sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners. This sheet came quite close to me. I watched it intently and saw in it all sorts of animals and wild beasts, everything possible that could walk, crawl, or fly. Then I heard a voice that said to me, Now, Peter, make your sacrifice and eat. I replied, I can't, my God. Nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. And a second time the voice spoke from heaven. Don't call profane what God has made clean. This happened three times. Then the sheet and what was in it was drawn up to heaven again. Just at that moment, three couriers stopped outside the house where we were staying. They had been sent from Caesarea to fetch me. And the spirit told me to have no hesitation about returning with them. These six believers came with me as well, and we entered Cornelius' house. He told us he had, been, had seen an angel standing in the house who had said, Send messengers to Joppa and bring back Simon, known as Peter. He has a message for you that will save you and your entire household. I had hardly begun to speak when the Holy Spirit came down on them in the same way she came on us in the beginning. 
And I remembered that what Christ had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. I realized then that God was giving them the same gift that had been given to us when we came to believe in our Savior, Jesus Christ. But who am I to stand in God's way? This account satisfied them, and they gave glory to God, saying, God has granted the repentance that leads to life, even to Gentiles. Here ends this morning's reading. Blessed be the word of God. I imagine that as Peter was on his way back to Jerusalem, that those in the council who knew Peter, had known him for a long time, had known his convictions, his commitment to keeping kosher, among other things, would have had more than a few unkind words to say about him. It's pretty likely they called him at minimum a flip-flopper likely a traitor to their people and their traditions. How could he? How could he have done such a thing as to go to the Gentiles, the unclean, the outsider, the denigrated and oppressed? But he did. And he showed up in Jerusalem and explained himself and explained why he took the stand that he did, a stand that even he could not have imagined taking just days before he took it. But God spoke to his heart. God showed him truth. And he could not not follow. He took a stand. This week we asked the question of the week, what does it take to take a stand even when perhaps no one takes it with you? What does it take for you to take a stand? What does it mean? What does it take within you to be so convinced that what you are called upon to do is right, that you do it Regardless, Peter thought he knew it was right. Taking a stand was simply doing what was hardwired in him, right? It was keeping kosher. It was knowing clean from unclean. He didn't have to think about it. It was a practice. And practices that lead us to behavior are good, but his, well, his practice kept him from experiencing that wild, crazy, all-encompassing, unabashed beauty of God's grace, God's overwhelming love. Spirit had to push Peter beyond the boundaries that his hardwired practice had established. He needed to understand that when Jesus told him that he was to love his neighbor as himself, that, well, that neighbor was more than who he thought his neighbor was. But after God made that clear to him, Peter could not not respond. And so he did what was radical, what was taking a stand that would cost him something, in the end, the council agreed with him. The others saw that spirit was moving, that God was still speaking. And God is still speaking today. That is why we are looking at the Phoenix Affirmations, an opportunity for us to listen with new ears, ears attuned to God's kingdom, that we might affirm what Jesus said in reality, for our own lives. This week, we come to affirmation number six, which calls upon us to take a stand. Christian love of neighbor includes standing, as Jesus does, with the outcast and oppressed, the denigrated and afflicted, seeking peace and justice with or without 
the support of others. Taking a radical stand, a stand with Jesus that might cost us something, doesn't usually come out of the blue like it seemed to have for Peter. He did a 180 and found a new path. No, for most of us, taking that stand is based on day-to-day practices that lead us on the path to that hill on which we know is inevitably the one on which we will take our stand, the hill upon which we are willing to die. That doesn't happen without preparation, without practice. If you are wondering, would you have been a person who stood up to Nazism in 1930s Germany? You can answer that question by looking inside yourself and asking, what stands are you taking today? Where are the places when you are called upon to act by the actions of others that are wrong and unrighteous and unethical? When do you speak up? And when do you keep silent? When do you take a stand? And when do you comfortably blend into the background and into the shadows? You would be a person who would hide Jews from the Nazis if you are a person who will speak up in the less risky ways that you are asked to speak up today. It's a constant challenge. It's a constant calling to be that person whom God has made you to be, to speak the truth that God has placed in you, to stand up for his right because, not because it is written, not because it's a tradition or a practice, but because it's written in your heart. And it's a practice of your living out the love of God in your life. A number of years ago, I was honored with the privilege of being the first fire chaplain called by the Brimfield Fire Department. But even before that experience, I had a hunch that being a minister, that being a pastor, was something akin to being a firefighter. Because you see, if you are a firefighter, you are awaiting that call. You don't know when it will come or what it will be. But when it comes, you respond and you have to know that you are ready. And so it is that for each of us, if we are discerning our call, if we understand who we are and what God expects of us, then when the time comes, when the tests arise, when the tone sounds, when the call goes out and it's time to respond, well, then you do, because it's not the time to question. When the fire alarm goes off at the station and the firefighters need to put on their gear and get on the rig and go to the fire or whatever it is out there, not knowing what lies ahead, they have to trust that they've been trained and they know their skills and they are ready. Are you ready? Do you even know what it is that you are being prepared for? That is our work. On September 11th, 2001, there were many, many first responders who were called upon to do something well beyond anything they had ever been called upon to do. And they had no idea when the alarm sounded that they would be responding to that, that they may be sacrificing their lives. Though, to be honest, most first responders understand that that is a risk that they take every time the tone sounds. And many offered their lives that day. And many who were not even on duty answered the call and showed up because they knew they had something to offer, not knowing what lay ahead of them, they responded. One takeaway from 9-11, if there is such a thing as a gift from that awful day, is that we understood, perhaps for the first time, but certainly very profoundly, that first responders 
understand holiness. Their devotion is an act of divinity, responding to divine love, knowing who they are and what their gifts are and offering them unconditionally, even if it meant laying down their lives, is exactly the kind of stand that Jesus takes with those on the margins, those who need our love, who need God's love through us the most. They knew that and they responded. The words of the Bruce Springsteen song, Into the Fire, capture that so beautifully. The lyrics in the song are those words of the spouse of a first responder longing, knowing that the loss, the sacrifice was an act of love. I need you near, but love and duty called you someplace higher, somewhere up the stairs into the fire. May your strength give us strength. May your faith give us faith. May your hope give us hope. May your love give us love. Friends, we need to honor the sacrifice of love of that day, of all those who responded. If we focus on the hate and the violence that was what happened that day and respond with our own hate and our own violence, if vengeance is what names us, then woe to us. For we have missed the lesson and we have missed God's presence. For God's presence is in going into the fire, going up the stairs, in being love where love is needed. It seems to me to be no mistake, no accident, but actually the work of spirit that the first registered casualty of 9-11 was a first responder who was a Franciscan priest, a chaplain in the New York Fire Department, Father Michael Judge. And just the day before his death, he spoke these words in the last homily that he ever delivered, given in the quarters of Engine 73, Ladder 42, Bronx, New York. He said, you have no idea when you get on that rig, no matter how big the call, no matter how small, you have no idea what God is calling you to, but God needs you. God needs me. God needs all of us. It may seem an odd thing, and indeed I agree that it is, that God would have any need, let alone a need for you or a need for me. But you know, that is how it is that God seems to work. God has chosen to work through you and through me. God has called each of us, perhaps into a fire. We may not know what it is. We may not know what lays ahead, but if we discern what it gifts they are that God has given to us, what our unique contribution is, well, then we might offer it when we're called upon. And then we might take that stand with Jesus, with those who are denigrated, those who are outcast, those who most desperately need God's love. And if we take that stand, and if we embrace all, regardless of what the world says about them, well, then my friends, we will know heaven. For therein is the kingdom of God for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. May we be those who see and hear and do 
and go into the fire and know the blessing of God. Amen. Friends, sometimes what we have to offer is a lament. Sometimes concerns, not only joys. We certainly offer our gifts to God regardless. We offer to God really nothing more than what God has already given to us. And sometimes we're asking God to make things better from what it is that we've received. And so let us turn our hearts and minds to God, making our financial gifts, offering those and offering ourselves as we spend some time in meditation. Mm -hmm. We offer our gifts to God, asking God's blessing upon the gifts and the givers. Mindful, especially this day of the gift of life laid down for friends and for strangers 20 years ago yesterday. And so we share this prayer written by the UCC minister who is a chaplain in the New York Fire Department. We pray for the fallen. They are the ones we love so dearly and miss so deeply. We have entrusted them to you and ask you to continue to embrace them in your love. We don't really have to tell you, God, since you already know. But we'll say it again. The ones who have died and whom we entrust to your care are some of the best people. Wise, brave, compassionate, joyful, wit smart, and really humorous. They are family, friends, neighbors, and colleagues. They are your beloved children. We also pray for the crestfallen. This day marks a time of so much sadness and grief for so many. We ask for your care and comfort for the living. Remind us again and again that you are with us and that you always have been. And now what, what joys and concerns do you have that you would like to share with us? You might unmute yourself and share, and then we'll offer to God in our prayers.
O oh, friends, let us turn to God with these prayers on our hearts, holding in silence those things that are close to us, knowing that God knows our hearts, God hears our desires, and God most truly cares and loves and is responding even already perhaps even in speaking to us in the ways that we should be part of that response. So let us turn our hearts and minds to God in prayer. God, in these days, we are so mindful of life itself, how difficult it is for some, especially when we suffer minor inconveniences and need to be sheltering in place for safety's sake. Yet others struggle day in and day out with hunger, homelessness. And addiction and mental illness and grief. Help us each to understand what it is to be human, what it is to share that experience with others. That even when it's not our experience individually, it is our experience collectively. Help us to hold out hope that new life always comes. We pray for those women who are with child, some in our own families. We pray for hope that is pregnant within all of us. Help us to give birth to hope and new life not just in our lives and in our families and our friends, but in all the world, offering the gift of your presence, your mighty power to any and all. We thank you that you have shown us that that is your will by doing it, by taking on flesh and knowing our suffering, knowing what it is to be fully human and showing us that to be fully human means to have great power. For we indeed possess your power within us, the power of that love, which is you, the mightiest force in the universe. And so in our flesh, we claim your presence and we thank you for the gift of your presence even today in words shared with us when you walked this earth so long ago words we pray together now saying our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs>
Friends, the prayer of the man who should be a saint, Father Michael Judge, regularly was, God, take me to where you want me to go. Show me the people you need me to speak to. Give me the words to speak. Give me the power to love and keep me out of your way. May we indeed receive that blessing. May we pray that prayer and live our lives in ways that knowing the gifts of others, the commitment, the sacrifice, that their strength may give us strength that their faith may give us faith, that their hope may give us love, and most especially may their love give us love. Go now into this dangerous world, spreading the gift of God's love, knowing God's presence with you, blessed and rich and empowered, from your time here, that your time there, wherever there is, may be holy and sacred and filled with the blessing of God. May the love of God be with you all and all those whom you love and all those whom none but God loves. Now and until that day of God's judgment, when justice will roll down like waters and peace will blossom among all the peoples.